2019 this year, um, we hosted a webinar and it was called Health and Wellbeing and COVID-19, Supporting Young People During the Transition Back to School. And during the seminar, we invited our guests to share with us their plans and priorities for the return of their uh, pupils to school after lockdown, particularly in relation to supporting their health and well-being. And what we've done today is we've invited those guests back uh, to revisit some of those discussions, but also explore some of the new or unforeseen issues that have arisen since their pupils have returned in August. And our panel in June included a head teacher and two deputy head teachers, uh, Tina Stones, who's the um, seconded two to 18 head teacher at Dornoch Academy, but is also the safeguarding and mental health and wellbeing lead officer in the Highlands. Jen Mingus is a deputy head teacher at the Royal High School in Edinburgh. And Mary Hume, who is a deputy head teacher at New Battle High School in Midlothian. However, unfortunately, Mary has had to pull out today uh, due to illness, but we're fortunate enough to uh, hopefully welcome Ka Carolyn Anstruther, although she's been having a few issues with her um, internet connection today. She's a deputy head teacher at Sheen's Primary School uh, in Edinburgh, and she's also their health and wellbeing coordinator and has a particular interest in children's mental health. So thanks, Carolyn, and thanks to the others for agreeing to join us uh, today and share your experience. Um, as Nicola said, my name is Shirley Gray, and along with Nicola, I'm the co-convener of the SARA uh, network entitled the Scottish Physical Education Research Network. And whilst the focus for many of us is physical education, um, we also have a number of teachers and academics who have an interest in whole school health and well-being. Um, my role today is going to pose some questions to our panel um, and hopefully initiate some really interesting discussion. And at various moments, I will pause so that we can field questions from the audience, either through the chat function, or at that point, we can also look to see if anybody wants to come in and, and sort of verbally ask their questions. And so please feel free to use the chat function as we're discussing uh, certain issues. And um, Nicola and Stephanie are going to help uh, field some of those questions, uh, as I've said, at various moments. So that's enough for me. Let's get started. Um, the in, in the first panel discussion um, in June, we talked about, uh, or you talked about, how staff, when they were uh, preparing for the pupils to return and when they were going to return to school, they had to prioritise um, pupil well-being, but that in doing so, you also had to consider staff well-being and staff training. Um, so I'm just going to pose the question, what kind of things did you do to support staff as, as they returned back to school in August and, and how was that received? Um, so, Jen, do you want to start us with that question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think it's probably appropriate to say at this point that everybody's experience is very different depending on the rates of transmission within schools. So, uh, and I can only share our experience, which we have been exceptionally uh, lucky in Edinburgh where the transmission rates are very low and I know that hasn't been an experience across Scotland so in terms of what we did to try and make uh, staff feel safe because I think that was a key thing because if staff feel safe their anxiety levels are lower and therefore they are they are more likely to be able to get to support pupils with their um, their well being. So the first thing that we did was really to look at the organisation of our school in terms of our, our school day. How can we change the organisation of our school day? So we went for a staggered start and a staggered end. No pupil was allowed in the school building um, until all staff had entered, and that has had a, a really positive kind of safe start for staff. Um, pupils didn't like it initially, but they adapted very quickly to that. We have a split lunch for S1 to 3 and then uh, 4 and 6, which distributes people more even, evenly throughout the school. Pupils are inside for 20 minutes and outside for the other 20 minutes, which means they're not in corridors. Staff feel safer when they're moving around corridors. The biggest change for us, though, and the most successful change that we made was that um, we changed our timetable to a two-week timetable. Now, within when you spoke or when I spoke in May, um, we had probably gone through at least four or five different models of recovery, none of which we have used. Um, however, this model has been particularly successful. So um, to try and explain it very simply, we reduced from seven periods a day uh, to four periods in a day. This resulted in almost one and a half hours learning blocks, if you like, or learning periods. Now, the major benefit here was it reduced the movement around the school. 
Um, it resulted in staff having less lessons to plan for. There was a better pace of learning with enough time at both the start and end of lessons for those kind of health and safety routines like the wipe down the hands and so on but it also essentially gave time for well-being conversations that wouldn't necessarily happen in a really busy 50 minute period where pupils were in and out and really the focus was all on learning so um, certainly the, the relationships that staff now have with people I think are a lot stronger but I know we'll come on to that at a later time in the, uh, the session tonight. Um, I think as well we encourage staff to have a limited time in the building so staff have to leave by five and a key thing which was a significant change for us was that staff were encouraged to work from home when they didn't have uh, classes so during their non-contact and that has resulted in a significant reduction in staff absence. Um, I'm going to stop there. There are aspects in relation to SQA that I would like to go on and talk about in terms of the return for staff, but um, I'll maybe give uh, Carolyn a chance to come in as well and give the primary perspective. Carolyn. Thanks, yeah. Carolyn. On you go. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think many of the things that you've said absolutely apply to primary as well. I mean, clearly there are there are differences in terms of timetabling things, but in terms of um, staff coming back feeling safely, a lot of the things that you've already covered definitely have applied to us too. Um, we have a very similar soft start um, encouraging people to go home. It doesn't always work, but we do encourage them. Um, also, we have allocated toilets so that people there's not as many people using the same toilets, increased um, cleaning that everybody's got across the school. We also, I think it was very helpful having the staff back in June um, for that brief period of time, because it did mean that they touched base again with the building and, and could see how it might look. And that's very helpful. I think um, one of the most important and one of the most useful things that I found was that the City of Edinburgh team with psychological services put together a package which, which they rolled out to um, senior leaders before the summer, which they we, I then delivered to the staff at the beginning, and it was all about their well-being. It was based on a rainbow um, acronym, but it was all about how we should tackle this and, and the conversations that should be had with staff coming back, all about reconnecting and and gave them a really, really strong platform to speak to the children. Um, and a wee bit like what you said, Jen, it was about taking time and it was about putting health and well-being as the priority for the children coming back. With, without a doubt, that was what was to be done. Um, and I think, yes, just, just making sure that everybody knew that the risk assessments were in place, those changed quite a lot as things developed, but that, that all those mitigations were in were in place for the the children coming back and uh, for staff to feel well but we did we've done quite a lot on um, mental health and um, support and training with staff already so we've introduced zones of regulation uh, which is a very very interesting thing to look at in terms of children's emotional well-being so we've done some staff training as well and um, as well as our emotion talk work and actually providing resources for staff coming back. So we had a whole lot of new books that had emotional well-being as their core. They weren't COVID related, but it did open up conversations about emotions and feelings just generally, right from primary one to primary seven. Thanks, Carolyn. Tina, do you want to add to that, please? Um, I think everything's been covered there. I mean, obviously I'm a two to 18 background under normal circumstances and I was seconded out at the time and working very closely with um, the educational psychology team. So they produced a lot of resources um, for both primary and secondary heads in terms of staff wellbeing, pupil wellbeing, returning to school. There was a, a very strong, sorry, am I echoing? Is that okay? Sounds okay. There was a very strong focus on health and well-being on the return to school um, and I echo everything that both Jen and Carolyn have said there. I think the pressure on the senior management team to do those risk assessments and those risk assessments sometimes changed uh, quite quickly and then they had to recalculate, re-timetable, um, plus with, and I know Jen's going to come to the SQA as well, I think all of that in the mix um, I think the way the head teachers coped and the way the senior leaders coped in schools was absolutely 
spectacular, both primary and secondary, because the pressure these professionals were under um, was quite monumental. And that was before they even got back into the building with the young people. Um, so there's certainly, there has to be continued work, I think, making sure that school leaders have any barriers to wellbeing being removed, um, because the, the job ahead of us is quite significant. We're not through the woods yet, as it were. Um, so yeah, same themes, uh, primary and secondary, but just adding a kind of reflection on the workload of the professionals involved in, in the school. Yeah, thanks, Tina. Um, and I guess the, the plan is to keep going with some of these uh, strategies for the, for the next academic year, at least. Yeah. For all of these schools. I mean, it's kind of links into the, the next topic, which is really about routine and structure. It's, and I, I guess that's hardly surprising because when we talked about pupil wellbeing the last time, we talked about their need for some routine and structure in their life. And perhaps what we're saying is the staff need that as well to some extent. But it sounds a bit like the school, the school's changed um, in terms of um, how it's organised, maybe even how it looks. I mean, what kind of things did you do to the, the structure of the, the school and the routine of the school to bring that back into the lives of, of the pupils as they returned? Um, Caroline, I don't know if you want to, to talk to that just now. I mean, um, definitely there, there were routines and structures that changed, but we were at great pains from the outside, uh, from the outset to say to the children, there are some changes, but actually when you come back, a lot of what you're going to have is going to be exactly the same because they needed to know that they were coming back into the same building. We were all there. We were glad to have them back. We were very glad to have them back. Um, and that actually there were changes, but there wasn't anything that we weren't going to be able to manage. And it might look a little bit different, but we did stress all the things from the outset, obviously, particularly for little ones, that's really important. But yes, there were, there were changes in, in structure. We have, um, we obviously were not going into each other's classes. There are bubble groups, which are class groups. Um, the PE is not now all outdoor, um, which is, is actually, we've been quite fortunate in being able to manage that. Um, we, like Jen, we, we split our breaks. Um, I'm in a school of 650 children, so that's no mean feat with a small playground. Um, so managing that is quite difficult and the children miss each other, but we, we've carved up the playground and we have different um, lunch times and different break times. Meals are delivered to the classrooms now instead of being in the dining hall because we need to maintain those bubble groups. Um, so yes, there are, there are changes, there are a lot of changes. Um, I'm, I'm very much at pains to try and, and keep things going and, and keep um, the important things that were features of our school still going. For example, prim my primary threes organised food bank and that, I definitely wanted that to happen and that looked very different because the children all came in with things and they put them in the playground and we had the food bank crates but they still managed it all and it's really important I think that for their well-being as well um, and able to, being able to give to other people that we try different ways to, to do as much as we would have done in the past. I'm, I'm now battling with nativity. That's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a tall order, but uh, yeah. But there are definitely changes to routine, but children are so resilient. That's, that's what I, one of the messages that I've found here. Even, even primary one, what they, what they have managed and how they cope with their changes constantly astonishes me. Um, I think we've got some questions coming in, but we'll come back to it. Jen, do you want to comment on that just now? And then we'll, we'll look to some of these questions. Yeah, just completely agree with Carol Ann there in terms of um, the resilience uh, and the ability of young people to adapt to change. Uh, it's just been amazing. And, and in some ways, much better than staff. Um, I think we find it more difficult to make those changes when it's I been, whereas um, they've come in and adapted really quickly to many of the changes. The one um, part, a bit of learning that we did very quickly was our change to our timetable was complicated, there's no doubt. And as much as we tried to scaffold that, scaffold that by providing kind of templates for pupils, we did find that our ESD kids found that 
exceptionally challenging. So we learned from that and tried to work and provide, you know, a more visual way of presenting the timetable, which um, did have a, a much more positive impact on their ability to remember. Um, and it's something that we still, you know, are we on week one, week two? What, you know, can you remember? And we try, I think the key thing there has been effective communication and a wee bit of kindness when they get it wrong, because inevitably both staff and pupils get it wrong. Sometimes they're out at the wrong times. Um, you know, they're down in the, the dining hall queue too early. There's lots of those issues that kind of happen on a daily basis, but um, it's uh, certainly become a far more forgiving place. And that extends to the, the kind of rituals and routines like uniform, about forgetting, you know, kids are late uh, and masks. And I have to say, it's a much more empathetic um, environment that we are currently working in. So that has been a significant positive that's come out of it. Yeah, great. I mean, Tina, please come in if there's anything you want to add here, but I think we might, you might have touched upon a question that's come in through the chat. Yeah, um, um, I could come in there in terms of, I can't talk about specifics, but I think when we talk about autistic children or children with additional support needs, we would, we should be, and we do focus on a child by child basis. So obviously it's, it's the needs of that individual child, but certainly something we were looking at as an authority, and I know this has been looked at nationally, were a range of social stories to support and to help them understand and make many of the transitions that have been quite complicated and challenging. Um, but I, I agree with everything Jen said there about empathy and kindness. As someone who has, um, I'm ambivalent about school dress anyway. Um, so it is interesting because I'm not in a school at the moment. I'm interested um, to hear how that might have changed the ethos to make into a more relaxed ethos because I know certainly as a head teacher um, of a primary and a secondary the primary it, it's not an issue you know and in the secondary um, kids sometimes get referred to your door because they x y and z um, whereas I think uh, you know as long as young people are comfortable certainly some of my young people who were autistic um, had difficulties with some of the school dress so I think that flexibility can actually be hugely beneficial to them but the schools that I've been into the young people are really um, they're resilient and they've adapted quite quickly. I think Jen's quite right that actually the, the young people have adapted very, very swiftly. Thanks, that's great. Um, do we have any questions from the audience at this stage, either in the chat or if you pop your hand up, you can come in and, and ask your question. So I'll just pause for a moment before we move on to see if anybody has any questions. Okay, well, we'll move on. And if you do think of a question, we will stop again to address those. So please um, keep using the chat function and hopefully we can come back to them. Um, so again, going back to the discussions we had in June, there was a really interesting discussion before about how some young people worked better online. So there was a lot of distance learning took place. And the, the digital skills that both staff and pupils had learned that would continue to be, to be used. So how are you currently using online learning? And what do you think are the implications of that for uh, the health and well-being of your pupils? Uh, Tina, do you want to? Um, a huge amount of work has been done in Highlands. I, I can't take the credit for any of it. It's um, the ICT team who, and there's a virtual academy being developed. Well, the virtual academy has always been around, but I think it's been developed um, more rigorously since um, to enable a better stretch of qualifications for young people across a geographical area. So one of the complexities in Highland is obviously and one of the beauties of Highland is we have very remote and rural schools. Um, the virtual academy is being developed to enable a wider choice of um, subject areas for children and young people right across Highland, which I think has moved. I think it would have happened in time anyway. But I think it's moved at a swifter pace because of the depth of learning that occurred during lockdown. Um, I think the teachers responded absolutely brilliantly during lockdown in terms of um, everybody was on a different learning curve because some people were really comfortable with online learning and some people weren't. So there was an ICT team um, at the centre that worked with practitioners um, to develop different um, strategies, both for primary and secondary. And I think much of that learning stuck. Um, as well as that, we've stretched it out to staff development and we've got a number of um, 
sites developing at quite a fast pace that are enabling um, more flexible professional learning. And obviously you're not taking, you know, if you live in somewhere where you have to travel a great deal and you're no longer putting that travel time in, then you can access professional learning more frequently, I would say. So as well as for the young people, I think the benefit for the, uh, the workforce as well has been, has been quite significant. And I think it has had a major, um, it's been a major shift that will be a long-term um, embedded in how we work. Does that answer the question? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'll ask the, the same question to the others, but there's a, another layer to it, I suppose. And it does sound in many cases really positive and actually in the Highlands necessary, I guess. But what are the health and well-being implications of that? So how how are issues around health and well-being kind of embedded in strategies to increase digital um, teaching and learning? So again, Tina, you can come back to that or if Carolyn and, and Jen want to, to come in. Yeah, I, I don't. I, yeah, we I find it very useful. Um, again, like Tina said, masses of staff learning in terms of that. Um, one of the things that I think is most important about it, obviously, is that you can keep connected. And that was the bit that it was absolutely essential. It was such a fabulous way to get to the families and to, to the kids. And um, as we were a bit um, slow in Edinburgh, I think, about, about getting, you know, videoing out, which we know certainly with our children with additional needs was incredibly important that they could see the members of staff. And so that was a massive benefit in terms of well, health and well-being, particularly. Um, we sent out Wellbeing Wednesday sways in which I love a sway, by the way, they're fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, so, so every Wednesday there was something well that went out in terms of health and well-being in particular. So we looked at um, gratitude and we looked at locus of control and we looked at and laughter and, and there were activities for the children to do that they could feed back and, and I think in terms of health and well-being the families and the children found that very useful um, but that connectedness is, is the thing that was really really beneficial um, as we know and um, there's a lot of wonderful things still ongoing with that and um, Midlothian um, Council have just produced a well-being advent calendar which is going out to people I've adapted that for our pupils as well but that was for designed for staff and it's a it's a great thing and I think ongoingly people are looking at ways to to try and um, get in health and well-being through through these um but but I, I found it the connectedness was was the absolute key of course that's really interesting thanks um Jen I don't know what your thoughts are and would be because I think when we spoke about this last time as well we talked about the senior pupils and, and yeah. exam preparation and, and, and relation to digital technology and health and well-being so I don't know if you've got anything to add there yeah absolutely uh, because that's a key that was a key issue for us I mean we were very fortunate in that we have been an iPad school now for um oh, between six and eight years so staff were very skilled already with the use of um with teams but the, the overriding factor for us was to prepare for what we expected to happen, which was significant numbers of pupils having to self-isolate um, and therefore having that work. So there was an equity about those pupils who were in class and those who were learning for home. So we have done a lot of work on recording parts of lessons so that those who are self-isolating can still access that from home. We've got pupils who are joining us live um, during that self-isolation, which has all worked exceptionally well. Um, I think that another additional benefit um, are the accessibility functions on the iPad. So for our ESL um, learners who maybe are dyslexic, you've got the color overlay. So a lot of these things which were very visible supports in the past are now able to access um, from their iPad, you know, the read text and the translation. So, um, there's still lots of work to be done, but as a staff, I think we hopefully in, in our senior phase, our pupils are still able to access their learning, whether they're at home um, or uh, actually in school. And one of the functions that's used regularly is, um, you know, checking learning through the use of forums using Microsoft 365, which gives staff immediate feedback as to where they're at in the learning and what and how they're best to progress. That's great. That's really interesting. Um, and I think it, it does generally seem like it's, it's been viewed in a very positive sense, even in relation to 
um, young people's health and well-being rather than something that, that perhaps is seen more negatively, which is, is good to know. And um, I think we might have a question. There certainly seems to be some text in the chat. Um, Nicola or Stephanie, have you? Yeah, it's not a question, um, but Kathleen says she works for a charity called Place to Be, um, which offers actually courses for teachers um, in mental health and it's funded by the Scottish government. The link is is on in the chat, um, but it might be something to, to look for uh, in terms of kind of continuing education. Thanks, Stephanie. Do we have any questions at this point again from the audience? I was going to ask a question if that's, if that's OK. Uh, yes, please, Mark, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, one of the questions I'd like to ask, actually, the, the, the panel really, is some of the changes that, um, are, that that have been made over the last year. I think obviously some of them have been, you know, quite detrimental to a lot of education, but some of them have been good. And I, again, the, the, one of the ladies made an example there of the staff being a bit more flexible, um, and you know, staff's well-being. I know from you know, as I'm sure we all do, sometimes when you get into a school, you go in at you know eight in the morning, you don't get out to six at night, and it's just like Groundhog Day, and you just feel sometimes a bit trapped in that environment and um, you know and you get to the deep dark winters and um, you know it does get to you it's, it can wear you down and it can wear staff down just looking forward do you think schools will reflect on these changes and may continue with these changes and you know certain areas such as the flexibility such as maybe you know um longer periods of time within classes or you know less classes and um, one of the things I think that has jumped out with us, I think the, the relationships between staff and pupils may have developed. Um, um, and another one is um, parental engagement, which I know is one of the national improvement framework. I think that that has certainly increased as well in certain communities. But it's just, do you think that schools will continue this or do you think that a lot of schools might just go back to the way they were when they first started? I, I don't mind coming in there if, um, I don't know whether it's primary or secondary or just generally, but I think that one of the things is that um, absolutely there's massive amount of reflection already on, what, on our practice and what we're doing and um, sometimes informally, but sometimes formally saying, actually, this is really good. You know, we've got the management team out of the gates every morning, right at the gates. I mean, we were always kind of present, but welcoming the kids in every morning and and those some some of those little things that we're just thinking actually this is definitely one that we're going to hang on to and um, flexibility with staff I think maybe is another thing we don't timetable obviously in the same way as secondaries but we have a non-contact periods we've got staff going home and I and I think that's really beneficial we, we can't have a lot of staff in the school as it is but I do think there are a lot of these things that we're looking at and thinking actually this is very useful and a lot of feedback from parents that we're taking on board um, as well and, and really looking. And I, th I think maybe, maybe one of the things we can get out of lockdown generally is that we have had a bit of a time to, to have a bit of reflection and they're not even just in our, you know, in our private life as well as things, just thinking actually there are maybe things that we can do differently. And I'm very positive that, that there will be things that in practice that can um, be positively impacted as a result of this. Thanks, Karen. Uh, that's really interesting. Thanks, Mark, for that question. Uh, Tina or Jen, do you want to respond to that as well? Just that yeah, idea, of, you know, what are the things that you're going to hold on to because the, the, it's been a really positive change? Yeah, um, I'd like to come in in terms of curriculum and timetable. I mean, pre-COVID, we were about to do a curriculum review um, and really the focus was on S12 and how to um minimize or reduce the amount of contacts they have throughout the week so one of the things that we are currently working on is how to within our current seven period day is move to as many double plot blocks of a, or double periods um right through from s1 to s6 so that's certainly one of the key learning points for us um not only just for i think the benefits it's had on the relationships with staff but also staff wellbeing. And um, the feedback that is quite clearly coming from our staff is they do not want to go back to seven periods in a day. Um, they were far more exhausted previously than they, they are currently. However, I would say that probably right now, if you were to ask them, they're absolutely 
exhausted. Um, but certainly they are looking forward to a revised curriculum um, as we move into, you know, 2021. Thanks, Jen. And Tina, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I'll come in and then I'll disappear. Um, I would echo everything um, that's been said here. I think um, I think there will be some areas that will be um, maintained and a better awareness of mental health from everybody um, is one of the initiatives that will hopefully come out of this. So we're all talking about mental health more and we're seeing it as a continuum. And I think people are beginning to speak about these things more openly. Um, I think school ethos is changing in some ways as well about, you know, we've spoken about flexibility, more empathy, more kindness. Um, so I would like to, to think that this would be a long-term change. And then there's other things such as the curriculum, the online learning, the online professional development, um, and overall holistic this will hopefully increase everybody's well-being because if you're not driving three hours to a course I mean obviously we're in quite a remote area then you're not as exhausted um the next day when you're back in school because you've not had that um added uh, burden and I think the relationships between the adults and the young people and the young people with their communities I think that's all shifting as we start to look at more trauma-informed approaches for example and we have a better understanding of um, what everybody's been through. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. thanks, yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, okay, thanks so much, Tina. I do realise you've got to go and I didn't say that, but that's great, thank you. Um, yeah, we definitely spoke at, uh, in June about this idea that um, more teachers would be prioritising health and wellbeing uh, in their teaching and their day, you know, in their day-to-day -day, um, lives within the school. And it certainly seems like that's happened. And, you know, I guess the question is whether that continues to happen or, or certain things begin to um, become more of a priority. But it'll be interesting to see how that, how that um, manifests going forwards. And in terms of going forwards or in terms of, uh, as I say, in June, we talked about the things that you uh, thought you might expect or the things that you planned for. Um, although, as we know, you were pretty much planning for the unknown to a large extent. Um, what ha what happened when you came back in August that you didn't plan for? What were the surprises? What were the unexpected um, things, positive or negative? Again, in relation to if possible, um, supporting young people's health and well-being. Jane, do you want to? Yeah, I can. I can start off. So um, there are actually many positives um, and surprises, pleasant surprises. I think the the key concern for many schools was the the, the fact that there had been limited transition for our P sevens into S one, and normally a lot of the supports that we would have in place we were just weren't able to do because of our bubbles. So one of the main surprises that we had was that our S ones who we had concerns about when we gave them their timetable and the movement around that we normally have buddies, they coped like amazingly well. They were, you know, sometimes the supports that we've put in place because we perceive there to be issues, um, there are no issues. It's just because it's a, a habit thing. We've always done that. And whilst they didn't miss the contact with the seniors, they were able to cope um, moving around the school, not getting lost. You know, we often had those supports in place for a week and really within one day, the pupils had an understanding and worked together better as a group of pupils rather than relying on the seniors. So that was a, a real positive. Um, I think as well that amazing compliance from the young people in terms of the rules and regulations, the hand washing initially, the hand gel that stank and they hated it and it smelt fish, could we please change it? Um, all of those kind of routines, the one way system, which we had in place beforehand and we always had challenge to, we no longer had challenge. We now have in our school, everyone is wearing a mask, S1 to S6. And again, we were concerned about um, you know, making that mandatory and we have had no issues. The pupils understand it. They, you know, we have explained to them why we're doing it. Um, and that really, we 
I've just been amazed by the young people and how compliant they are and working with us rather than against us. And, and kind of finally, the, the biggie for us is um, that young people are now demonstrating young people behaviours outside. So what is really nice to see, to see in today is a perfect example is our fields are so muddy. They are out there. They are having fun. Nobody is on the phone. We have, in their words, forced them out, but actually what we've forced them out to do is be young people again and play, which um, is really good to see in our S1 to S3 cohort, particularly that they're not inside sitting on their mobile phones and not communicating with each other. So that's been a pleasant, kind of three main pleasant surprises for us. Yeah, that's great. And actually we spoke about that in June as well, in terms of the, uh, young people um, demonstrating autonomy in their learning that they were just given the work and told you have to to some extent get on with it and they did and that, uh -huh. I guess that was a bit of a surprise then and that seems to have con continued as well and I suppose these are things that you can try and encourage going forward as well just yep. to sustain that a little bit um, and it's nice to hear that they are getting out into the playing fields and running around as well yep. maybe it's something to do with the cold weather though <laughs> <laughs> um, Carolyn, do you want to add to that as well? So some of the, the, the unexpected things, and again, sort of trying to focus around um, links to health, work, health and wellbeing. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I mean, very much what Jen said, uh, we found, I, th I think really one of the things is that um, as teachers, we tend to, and I certainly put myself in this category, is that we like to have it all under control and have it all sorted and taped before we go back and you know all the plans laid but one of the things that we have had to do is get a bit more comfortable with uncertainty and and change coming um, and I think that that's been a bit of a key thing for us and um, the surprises sometimes come when we we don't expect them and we've got to kind of move with them I think some of the challenges here I mean this is a very big building is is in terms of managing space and making sure the kids have got enough space and movement. And I think that is one of the most difficult things. And one of the biggest changes probably here is that, you know, the children are in some, in some classes in rows, the little ones are not obviously, but, you know, making sure there's enough movement breaks is so important that children are not sitting for, you know, there's obviously it's limited what we, we can do, but that we are factoring in going outside a lot and that we're, we're having lots of breaks for the children throughout the day so that there aren't extended periods of time that they are sitting. So that's, that's really key for us, but yeah. Um, I think one of the other things that, that I'm really conscious of is, not that I didn't expect it, but certainly for some people, there are levels of anxiety with a few of the children that, that, I've, that I've really had to address um, almost on a one-to-one -one with a few of them. So. Um, it's really about noticing. I think it's all about noticing with the staff as well and with the kids that, you know, there's maybe something a little bit different because you think that you've got it all sorted and that, but people, people have lives and people are, things are going on and it's about responding to that and, and, and seeing if somebody, you know, is needing a bit of a check in or if, if some of the kids are seeming a bit anxious. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a bit of anxiety for a few of our children that, that, that I've had to address that, that I wouldn't necessarily have um, in, in the past. So there is a bit of that out there, definitely. Thanks for that, Carolyn. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn and Jen. Is there any other questions that people would like to ask? Put it in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand and come in and ask a question to the panel. I've got a little bit of a question around um, the, the compliance that you talked about, Jen, and, and apologies, Carolyn, I missed what you said there. This is one Sorry. of the joys, the joys of working from home. Sorry, um, so someone's got a question come oh, up and go that. That's Sorry, fine. Just, I didn't want to. Um, so someone's asking, do you think the adaptive timetable should have been a nationwide approach? My school is still on a seven period day, but I can really see the benefits. Um, especially from longer and fewer classes in a working day. I feel because of the big push in health and safety, these relationships often aren't established given time to grow. Um, Jen, do you want to respond to that? I think, you know, I think that's a really interesting point and it was really interesting hearing about how you felt that had helped, seemed to help both yeah. pupils and staff. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to criticise the senior management or leadership in any other school. 
what I can say that has worked here and many schools in Edinburgh have adapted a similar model. There was talk at the authority of maybe having a standardised model, um, but it doesn't work for all. Um, but certainly for a very large secondary comprehensive like ourselves, um, I think if you were to ask almost all of our staff, they if we went to vote, they would certainly vote for a continuation of um, a reduction from seven. Um, we are hoping to go for four as we move forward, four blocks in a day or four periods in a day of around about, um, you know, a double block being 250 minutes. So um, I can only talk for our own experience, but yes, and we I would be happy to share with the, any school our current model, uh, because we are continuing this until we are out of this, which I think will be right until the summer. And how do you find that... Um that long period of time for the, the, the pupils in the class? Is there, is there breaks built in? Like Carolyn was saying, kind of looking at trying to build breaks in because in terms of learning, that can actually be quite difficult, can't it, for that long period of time? I know working with students ourselves and having long periods of time, you're trying to work out times for breaks and things. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's one of the biggest challenges and staff are getting around that by having a break um, in between, you know, just how, either they're, they're allowed to go on their iPads or they're doing Kahoot or they're doing something fun to kind of break it up because especially just if we'd had the ability for to plan more effectively, our timings would have been much better, but there are certain times within our, our day where it is a lot of an afternoon can be a long afternoon if you've got say a second year class that isn't a subject that they're not particularly engaged in, then there needs to be that break. And that's something that we've consulted with pupils on, that's come through our pupil parliament that they want that break. So again, staff are doing their best to adapt their lessons to have that. There are significant benefits though within the senior phase, especially around um, formal assessments. We do not do prelims uh, here. So what that's allowing staff to do is to have, you know, almost where they would have sat formal assessment in, a, in the hall over an extended period of time, they now have got the ability to do that during class time. Oh, that sounds good and good to hear that the pupil voice is coming in on that and getting the pupils' perspectives as well, thanks. Um, Shirley, do you want to, did you want to ask that question? Sorry, when I interrupted you there. <laughs> no, that was a good question. I think that was from Sam. That was a good question. Thanks, Sam. And please, if anyone else wants to come in, um, to ask any of these questions. I suppose mine was more of a, um, a comment really because I've been doing a little bit of reading around the importance of young people feeling a sense of belonging in school and just some of the things that you've been talking about in terms of um, having longer times with, with your pupils so developing a, you know, a, a closer relationship with them or having conditions where you potentially can develop better relationships with them, um, showing empathy, caring for them, explaining to them why they have to wear their masks and the fact that they all feel like they're in it together. I mean, it does sound like some of the things that you've had to do because of COVID have actually really uh, promoted a, a better sense of belonging within the school. I don't know whether that's a, a feeling that you have, um, Carolyn or Jen. Yeah, ve very much so, I think. Um, and I think there's lots of ways to do that. I, I definitely think that's a feeling. There was definitely a very strong fe feeling that everybody was glad to be back. Um, one of the things that we did was there was a there's a very nice analogy that um, we were all in the same storm, but we were all in different boats. And I think that these kind of visual things are are great to to reinforce some of that that you, you were talking about. And um, so we made huge displays of that, and the children all made a different boat and um, to put in the in a great big background. But I do think that sort of sense of unity and then. Um, and, and fun and trying to do things as a school, even though we're maybe not mixing in the same way that we were is really, really important. And I think that sense of belonging is essential for children um, and, and, and really trying to, to push that forward. So there, there's a lot that we can still do to do that. We've got a 12 days of Christmas plan on the go. And um, so we're going to be disco dancing in the playground in the right space, but you know, and just things that we can all do together at the same time, hot chocolate and, co um, a, a, and a book on the same day. So the whole school's doing it, not necessarily maybe together, but we'll, there is that sense of unity and belonging that we are continuing to try to foster. Yeah, Jen, I don't know if you've got any views on that or anything to add. Um, 
No, I think the kind of, in trying to, to bring our school community together, it really, the key kind of issues are, are over communication. And that's been exceptionally difficult to do. So there have to be creative solutions to that. Whereas you'd normally have an assembly, we now have um, team sessions. So there's regular um, sessions from the head teacher to, to all the pupils during Friday forum. And that's been really helpful because one of the things we were very keen to do is get our pupil parliament up and running so that we could hear, you know, what, what, what were the issues that were really affecting the young people? How can we feed back to them and keep those lines of communication uh, open? And we did the same with staff. And that's something that's kind of an ongoing feature of the school are, are the kind of key points of communication and feeding back, you know, you said we did type thing, which would be normal in any year, but it, there are greater challenges in doing that. And it's really important for, all of the pupils that there is that sense of normality we you know we still have our senior leadership team our pupil team we've still got our nation captains uh, we're trying to um, have as many of our kind of extracurricular groups up and running as possible within the guidelines um, and it's trying to keep all these kind of key things that they really rely on those additional benefits of uh, being in a school other than just in class learning um, and finding creative solutions and to make them happen. Great. Uh, do we have any other questions? I think that perhaps this one just come in. One, it's a good one uh, that actually links with something I was going to ask about, about um, has there been an increase in time spent taking the learning outdoors um, for other areas of the curriculum? Because obviously PE has seen a lot of that um, and how have staff and people responded to that was their anxiety. So I was going, I was thinking about that myself, if there's been more access or use of the outdoors and how that's, um, how that's gone. Carolyn or Jen, do you want to comment on that? Absolutely, and, and that was that was very clearly a priority from City of Edinburgh Council that that absolutely would happen, and, and not just um, not just in a play sense, but definitely to take the learning outdoors. There's a lot of maths going out on outdoors, and the, we have to manage the space again. And um, we use we're very fortunate because we are very close to the meadows here, so. Um, our primary sevens are there all the time, but all the PE is outdoors as much as possible, and um, almost all of it has taken place outdoors. But yes, um, lots of maths, lots of literacy, lots of uh, problem solving. Um, there's been a huge amount, and, I, and, and like we talked about before, um, I think it was Mark's question, what will stay? I mean, definitely that is something that we will continue with. Thanks, Caroline. Jane? Yeah, I mean, it definitely is something that is encouraged. I wouldn't say that probably the weather has been too conducive, um, you know, for some of our secondary kids to be out uh, learning, but certainly our outdoor classrooms have uh, seen an increased use. And, you know, as a former PE teacher, I have to say the PE departments across Scotland, you have had a really, really tough time and you have tried to find really imaginative solutions to get those young people out there and active. And you've done an amazing job right across Scotland. So well done, hats off to you. Thanks, Jen. Um, earlier there was another question in the chat. Do you want me to put it forward? Yes, please. Um, so Colin's asking about um, changes within professional networks. So for example, could experienced pupils might not have had much face-to-face -face contact with social workers during this period. Have the panel members noticed shifts in support patterns or engagement with pupils who have other professional services involved? I think that's a good question. Think, you know, linking about thinking about ideas around GERFIC and linking together with other uh, professionals. So how, how have you seen that? Um, Jen, Carolyn? Yeah, that has been a massive challenge for um, any young person who has previously engaged with uh, an external service that unfortunately due to the COVID restrictions has just not been able to happen. And we are finding it really difficult to, to find the appropriate supports within school for some of um, our young people who, who really need those external partners to, to, to complement what we can actually achieve in school. So. Um, we are hoping that some of those restrictions can be lifted as quickly as possible so we can start to work with key partners that make an incredible difference to, to the lives of these, uh, these young people who need it most. Thanks, Jane. Carolyn? 
Very much the same picture in the primary. I mean, obviously, I think they would love to be back. We certainly would love to have more of them in more of the time. Um, obviously, their engagement in the service at child planning meetings is great. That can all be done. But, but definitely, we very, very much miss having people in the building to support the children. Thanks. Shirley? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm just looking at time there. It'd be great to have Hello. some more questions from the audience. But um, if, if so, I mean, I can pause for a moment, but I think I, one of the, the final questions where we're going to ask is, you know, what, what are the plans for the future then? And I guess we probably have spoken about some of the successes and how you plan to take those, those forwards. Um, but if there's anything that we've perhaps missed in that respect, so things that have worked, things that have changed things for the better, and how you're going to build on that for the next academic year and perhaps even beyond. I think possibly rather than for me thinking about the future, I think one of the key issues I haven't actually mentioned tonight is um, the SQA and the challenges that for um, our senior phase that are on a daily basis our pupils are expressing significant concerns and anxieties around the uncertainty, the changes, the, the media, um, and it's really hard to keep them, uh, them focused and um, have, I suppose, a perspective on things um, due to that, that uncertainty. Um, and that's something that we've kind of worked hard to, to be able to share. And we've created three kind of assessment phases. So they're well aware of that as to when their dates are, um, to make sure all the supports are in place and to reassure them that you know we're generating the evidence over a period of time um, but that certainly is something that uh, continues to be a significant challenge especially for those pupils in S5 who didn't sit an exam last year they have built up in their heads often uh, you know it's significant anxieties around what that might be like and they've not had that experience so that's something that is currently our, our, one of our biggest challenges in relation to mental health. And, and what are some of the things that you're trying to do there, Jen, just to cope with that? I think, uh, again, it comes down to clear communication and reassurance. Um, we had a, a team session with a head teacher and myself with all of our senior phase and really just set out or reassured them about what we, the measures that we do have in place that, you know, going forward that we are continually generating evidence of the mess up in one, that's not the be all and end all, it's, you know, a continuous um, kind of gathering evidence on a continuous uh, basis and allowed them to ask questions. And really that, uh, just keeping the lines of communication open, making sure that staff are not passing on their own anxieties about whether the exams are going to go on or not, that we're almost containing ourselves and trying to reassure them that it's, you know, it's for the higher and advanced higher, it's as normal. So let's keep progressing um, with that in mind that, and until we know otherwise. And, and right now those exams are going ahead. So let's keep that as our, our main focus. And with the National Fives, it is about trying not to make everything about assessment, that there are three key assessments that you will do including some classwork that may or may not be marked, um, but it's a journey. So we'll support you on that journey as, as best we can. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it sounds really challenging, but again, we've come full circle a little bit in terms of talking about, you know, the role of staff in this and staff's anxieties and, and how they might communicate or that or, or not to the to pupils. Uh, Carolyn, thanks, Jen. Carolyn, is there anything you want to finish with just to in terms of the now or the future and and where you might be going next? Yeah, I think I think really reinforcing what Tina said when, when she was on earlier um, and a wee bit back to Mark's question again, that it will give us a chance to reflect and, and to look at practice and, and to make sure that the, the kindness and empathy and all these really important things are the sort of key things that we're looking for. And certainly I feel in this school, although you know the staff are marvellous anyway, but the real build up of the team spirit and, and everybody looking out for each other and the children as well, they are incredible, um, is the thing that we'll take and move forward with and build on. That's great. That's lovely to finish on that one. I mean, that's five o'clock now. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank um, you both and Tina, who's not here with us at the moment, um, for your insights. Really appreciate your time and really appreciate, as I said, your insights. Um, we've learned lots from the seminar in June. Where we've learned lots again today and uh, good luck with everything in the future. And I hope it all goes 
well for you, for your staff and for your pupils. Um, and thanks to Nicola, thanks to Deb, thanks to Steph, and thanks for everyone else who, who's turned up today and, and, and joined us. Um, yeah. but I think that's, that's us. Yeah, thank you, Shirley. Yeah, a great session, really interesting um, from the panel. Just was totally absorbed in everything that was being discussed there and lots of thinking happening and good questions from our audience as well. Thank you for participating. Um, this will be available on the CIRA website, so go and have a look there. Also, CIRA is a charity, um, but we do have memberships. So if you're interested in becoming a CIRA member, go onto the website and you'll find out more about us there. We will have future CIRA Connects events in the new year um, with our Poverty Network hosting events, our Early Years Network. There'll be a joint event between our Leadership and Teacher Education Network, so look out for these coming in the new year. Um, so hope you all get a rest over Christmas and look forward to seeing you in 2021 and hope it's a bit better than 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank if you. If the panel wants to stay on, we can just say a final thank you to you all. Yeah. Enjoy your evenings. <laughs>